Shinobi, open your eyes. For the sake of your master. Hey everyone, it's Blue Lizard Jello, and welcome back to Everything Possible in Sekiro. Shadows died twice last time we started our adventure. We found our Lord Kuro in the Moonview Tower, and we fought and defeated, or so we thought, Lord Genichido. Now we woke up in this dilapidated temple with this shiny shinobi prosthetic tool. We already read the description in the last episode, but it does seem to suggest that we are going to be able to do a lot of different things with this shinobi prosthetic. And it very well all could be thanks to this man sitting behind us, the sculptor. So we're finally going to learn a little bit about the sculptor. In fact, let's go ahead and start that process now. What do you call yourself? Your eyes, the eyes of a wolf who has failed in his duties, or so it seems to me. That is not your concern. <laughs> Spoken like a true shinobi, I must carve the Buddha. You do what you will. Why am I here? All I did was drag you here. Didn't even know if I was dragging a corpse. Couldn't let you get eaten by a pack of wild dogs. How long was I asleep? <laughs> Some time has passed since I found you. I see. However, your master yet lives. <clears throat> He's being held prisoner in Ashina Castle. They will soon make use of his bloodline. Looking at you, I'm sure you appreciate the value it has. The sculptor seems to have some information about Kuro that we do not yet possess. He seems to know a little bit more about the bloodline that Kuro had mentioned in the last episode, and he suggested that maybe we appreciate a little bit more than most people. Probably something about that. In fact, let's ask about the Divine Heir's blood. What did you mean when you said they'll make use of his bloodline? I don't know much about him, except the dragon's heritage. There's a special kind of blood by that name. And that blood runs through your master's veins. So the divine heir. Someone's after him. Might be that the strange things happening to your body have something to do with that. Dragon's heritage is the name of the blood running through Kuro's veins. And for that reason, someone is after him. You're quite the strange one. Yet other peculiar visitors have come to this temple. There's one in the clearing to the right of the gate, leading off the temple grounds. Two strangers in strange circumstances. You two might get along. The sculptor here is referring to Hanbei the Undying. We're going to be talking to him in this episode as well. But the sculptor does have a little bit more information for us about this particular statue right behind us. You again. I must carve the Buddha. You do what you will. Yes, right. That kind-faced Buddha you see over there? Don't do anything funny with it. We could also get that information if we had come over here to you inspect the, the Buddha. kind-faced Buddha there? It was when a man must confront what is inside of him. It can probably be of help. Confront what is inside him? Anger. Sadness. Or perhaps old memories of times long gone. That kind of thing. So this Buddha, unlike all of the others that line the walls of this dilapidated temple, this Buddha was sculpted by the true sculptor. And it allows you to peer inside oneself and basically unleash whatever is under there waiting. Might be anger, might be sadness, could be memories. Now just taking a look at the sculptor, notice that, well, for one, he has quite hairy arms and legs. And I'm pointing that out not just to simply make a joke at his expense, but that could very well come important later on as we talk to other NPCs. But also, we see a right arm, we don't see a left arm. And even as he's carving the Buddha, which he will go back to doing here momentarily, he holds the Buddha with his feet, and he carves with only his right hand, his left arm nowhere to be seen. Just like we happen to be missing our left arm other than the fact that we have this prosthetic. Now, this NPC would not normally be here if you didn't quit the game out or rest at that sculptor's idol. 
She appears once you've done one of the two things, but since I have quit in between episodes, she has now appeared so we can talk to Emma. But before we do that, notice the dress. See the patterns on that skirt? This is the one who dropped the ornamental letter to us when we were stuck down in the well. You truly returned from the dead. The power of the dragon's blood. I never thought I'd see it with my own eyes. Who are you? My name is Emma. I am a doctor serving a certain master. What master? Forgive me, but for his safety, I cannot reveal his identity. However, my master gave explicit orders to assist you in any way I can. Hmm. I'm not telling you to trust me. However, I must fulfill my master's orders. The gourd of medicinal water you possess, that was originally a creation of mine. I am a doctor, and I will assist you in that capacity. When we picked up the healing gourd and we read the description, we learned that this was created by the apprentice of a certain Dogen. Now we know that Emma here, Emma the Physician, is that apprentice. She's the one who created the gourd. Notice that she also talks about how she has a master who gave her explicit orders. And while she doesn't think that necessarily we should trust her, she's at least not asking us to do so, she is simply stating she is following orders. You made this gourd. Yes, it was intended for Lord Kuro, but it seems he entrusted it to you. I'm sure you may have noticed, but the medicinal waters in this gourd spring forth on their own. Even after being emptied, you will find it full again after a short rest. Yes. Is there a way to improve it? Bring me gourd seeds. Gourd seeds? Yes. Medicinal waters flow from gourd seeds. Adding new seeds will increase the volume of these medicinal waters. If you find any, bring them to me. All right. I'd like to make a request. What is it? Please show me your face. What? Hmm. This white mark, is it a birthmark? No. Then that must mean it appears on those who have received the dragon's heritage. Or perhaps it's a symptom. Hmm. Are you done? Yes, that will be all. I'm sorry. That was rather rude of me. We have gotten a lot of information already out of Emma. She just inspected our face to notice this white mark that you can see on our right cheek. I'll get a close-up look of that here in just a moment. But she says that this is only applied to those, or it's a symptom of those, who have received the dragon's heritage. That faded bloodline that's running through our master's veins. She also mentioned that we have indeed come back from the dead. Now, I don't believe that she's referring to the fact that the sculptor dragged us here after our left arm was cut off from Lord Genichido. Because an arm cut off, while devastating, isn't necessarily a death sentence. So perhaps she's referring to something else. Maybe that night that Kuro was mentioning earlier on. Goodbye. Now, let me see if I can't get a really good look of that mark. There we are. That white mark is what she's referring to, and she'll actually reference that more than once. Now before we go and talk to Hanbei or collect the few items that are around, notice on this dilapidated temple all of these paper charms. This is something that I completely ignored the first few times that I came to the temple, but these are omomori. These are paper charms that are put on typically a dwelling, or it can be really any object, and it's meant to offer protection or luck. These can be sold by Shinto or Buddhist shrines, and this dilapidated temple is absolutely covered by them. They're not on the inside, though. They're not on the inside, only the outside. So, are these charms to keep something out? Maybe to keep something in? We'll have to talk more about that as we continue. Now, let's run right behind the temple. All these luscious stands of bamboo. And we get a light coin purse, a purse filled with a small amount of sen, 100 to be exact. It can be used to acquire the sen inside. It has a somewhat satisfying weight to it, and the sen in this purse is not lost upon death. This is a really nice mechanic in Sekido, because when you die, you will lose 50% of the gold or the sen that you have on you, as well as the progress you've made towards your next skill point. 
but the Sen that is inside these coin purses is not lost. So you can actually invest in these coin purses and then nothing is lost. We'll talk about that as we come across different vendors. So here's our Sculptor's Idol, but before we get that, let's grab these two pellets here. And then up in the clearing, this is where the Sculptor was referring. And we have another NPC. This is Hanbei, the Undying. Mm. Never seen you before. Your name? <sighs> Won't tell me. But you do have the look of a skilled shinobi. A shinobi. Or perhaps... Hmm. Sir, please heed my humble request. Face me in battle. He immediately draws a sword and he wants us to fight him. You can see that he has just a single death blow. And it's over very quickly. Except it's not. Damn. Still alive. Let's find out a little bit more about our undying friend here. That swordsmanship, it was a thing to behold. Few have managed to kill me in such a thorough manner. What are you? Some call it undying. Others infested. I can't die, so I just am. How about you? What brings you to a rundown temple like this? Hmm. <laughs> Seems you have a lot on your mind. Say, why don't you use me for some sword practice? Might come in handy for whatever your mission is. A warm body that can't die might prove useful to you. I volunteer mine. Well? So at this point, we can either accept or refuse. You can always come back and accept if you refuse at this point. He is now going to help us train in the different skills that we have. He'll start out very basic, and as we learn more skills throughout the game, we can come back and we can practice those skills and we can even engage in free combat with him, which means he will use any tactic that he has available and we can use any at our disposal to try and hone our skills. Very well. Right then. Let's go. They say swinging one sword is a cure for boredom. At the beginning, we don't have too many options. Right now, we just have attack, deflect, or step dodge. Once we've completed all three of these, that's when the free combat option will open up. Now, I'm not going to do these on camera. I will do them off camera just to advance the different trainings that he has, but it's something I do very much recommend. Instead of worrying about getting hit and dying out there on the actual battlefield, perform the different skills on Hanbei the Undying to really hone those skills, especially for some of the more advanced ones that we'll learn later on. Have you noticed this temple attracts those with nowhere else to go? I certainly fit that description. Hmm. And I suppose that's why interesting things make their way into the offering box from time to time. Come back whenever you like. If you have techniques to try out, I'm at your disposal. He mentions this offering box right here. And even though there is a little bit of a tutorial, it doesn't give us all that much information. It will be illuminated if there's something inside to pick up. And if you want what's inside, you will have to pay varying amounts of Sen. The only items that will appear there are key items that will only appear if you cannot get them any other way. For example, there's a particular upgrade item for one of our Shinobi tools we'll be getting that a merchant sells. And if that merchant is killed or if he disappears from your game, then that upgrade material will appear in the offering box for sale. So it's an okay idea to go back and check from time to time, but don't be surprised if most of the time, if not all the time, you find it empty. And now we have our very first illuminated sculptor's idol. Here we can do a number of things that will open up as we continue to play through the game. Currently, we can just rest. Rest will not only respawn all the enemies, resting will not only respawn any enemies, but it will also refill our gourd and it will refill our spirit emblems, which we haven't collected any just yet. And it'll also refill any items that were in our storage. We can only hold select amounts of varying items. And then any others that we collect will go into storage. And it'll be automatically pulled out whenever we rest. We'll also be able to quick travel once we start to unlock other sculptor's idols. And it'll allow us to purchase skills by spirit emblems, increase our vitality and posture with prayer beads, or increase our attack damage with memories. And then later on, once we have seen what Dragon Rot is and what it can do, we'll be given the option to cure Dragon Rot as well.
The only other thing to take note of before we head out into the wide world is this path over here leads right to the temple. We cannot have our sword unsheathed until we get a little bit further into this cave. And there's just this little dugout passageway, almost like a mine. And there's a shape of a person along the wall. And as we approach it, it does allow us to hug the wall just like every other wall. And when we do it, you can see that it almost matches the shape exactly, but it says it's sealed from the other side. There are a few walls like this in Sekido that when you hug the wall, a hidden panel will transport you to the other side. That one in particular has some really interesting implications. But that's it for the dilapidated temple. Now we get to finally start practicing with our new tool. And we have the grappling hook. So by default, this is going to be the left trigger. You can see that this bridge is out. That is a common theme here in Sekido. Apparently the bridge builders leave a little bit something to be desired. But watch the symbol. You can't just grapple onto everything. And you can see here, I'm out of range. And as I approach it, it becomes a different color. That's when you know that you can grapple. Sometimes you'll have to jump in order to grapple. So for example, I can't reach that other grapple point right now, but if I jump to it, then I can. Sometimes that is going to be a little bit of a leap of faith, but it's something that you'll want to practice because in time, it's going to, be, it's going to become very necessary. Here we are in the Ashina outskirts. We can see the Ashina castle dead ahead. Everything that we can see that has a structure, we will be going to and we will be exploring. The level design here is pretty well done. Something that I have admired since the very first time I played this. So for example, let's practice here. I can grapple onto the ends of this tree or I can grapple onto this one, but only if I jump and grapple. Right away, we're already treated to another sculptor's idol. No real reason to rest here, but now you can see that the travel option has opened up. Important places will always include the dilapidated temple, so it's nice and easy to get back there. Now that menu also had some other options. We'll talk about that as they become relevant. But we can start to see a few of our opponents. There's a guard there. One down here. And if we just grapple over to this rooftop, we're going to get another tutorial. This is going to talk about stealth death blows. This is going to be that jumping death blow that I unfortunately failed to accomplish in the first episode. But this time, it couldn't be that difficult. And we also get yet another tutorial. By the way, there is a mod out there that will allow you to turn off these tutorials for good if you're on PC. Currently, no mods exist for the console version of Sekido, but this is how we're going to acquire loot. After we've killed an enemy, you can see these items floating above him. Now, currently, he only gave us Sen. If there was an item, it would look a lot like that bag that's right over there. But in order to collect it, it's going to either be square or X, and you become a little bit like a vacuum, and you have some pretty good range there. This is exactly where we came from, just up there. There's another bridge that's out. And of course, we can sprint. This is something that took me far too long to notice. The dash button, which is the B or the circle button, if you hold it in, will allow you to sprint. You also don't have any stamina whatsoever. You can sprint for this entire game if you so choose. There's another pellet, and you see that symbol directly to the right of the word pellet. That means that we already have as many as we can hold on us, which is currently three, and the rest are being sent to storage. We have some grapple points around us, but this right here is trying to teach us something else. Here's a ceramic shard, a piece of pottery that breaks with a satisfying crack when thrown. Throw it at an enemy to draw their attention. Notice it says throw it at an enemy, not near an enemy, but actually throw it at an enemy. Throwing and smashing such pieces made for a popular sport amongst Ashina boys. Even after growing up, they remember the old games well. Go ahead and get this equipped. And right around the corner, we have another enemy. This item is placed here for a very specific reason. Remember that we can hug the wall, and when we get to a corner, we can peer around. We can also target enemy. And once we've targeted them, we can throw that piece of ceramic shard to get their attention. Really, really good for pulling a single enemy out of a group. And once he comes around the corner, we can get that amazing death blow. That's going to become extremely important once we have a lot of enemies to fight, if we want to do it stealthily. 
Now we have this other enemy up here. I'm going to take care of him with a nice stealthy execution. Careful not to get spotted by that enemy. We'll deal with him in a little bit. But we're going to do just a tiny bit of backtracking to get this item up here. Very important piece of candy. Ungo's sugar. Sugar candy made in Senpo Temple sustaining Ungo's blessing. Temporarily reduces vitality damage taken from physical attacks. This is vitality or health damage, not posture damage. Bite the candy and take the Ungo stance to impart its inhuman benediction. By doing so, you endure the excess karma of man from the spirits within. Senpo monks spread this candy across Ashina in honor of her military heroes. We got one single Ungo sugar. There are a number of different types of candy spread throughout Sekido. Each one will last 30 seconds unless you have a particular skill that you can acquire later on. That will increase it by 50% to 45 seconds. Just take note of a few things here. We have that patrolling guard with a shiny right behind him. We also have along the cliffside, we have that one glowing lantern right there. That is telling us not to miss out. But we're going to loop around on him. Just a second. First, I want to go take care of this one other guard that we had. Once again, getting that jumping death blow. Collecting all the loot. Now we have something right here that will allow us to hug the wall. That freaks me out every time, but don't worry, you are safe. I crouch in these bushes. So we have the one guard here. He will be patrolling. We also have a ranged guard up there, and then there's another one waiting at that gate. But instead of going this way, I'm going to go a different route because I want to show another couple of modes of execution that can be extremely satisfying. We're going to loop back around a little bit. Grapple our way back up here. We're going to go onto the roof. Get a little bit better lay of the land. So we have, there's those two enemies we just saw. Some loot hiding behind them. And we have this enemy here who's been patrolling. So we're just going to stealth our way around. Jump onto this rooftop. Hopefully wait for him to turn around. And then get, once again, another failed jumping death blow. But at least we got the backstab. Don't forget to collect your loot. Another couple of ceramic shards. And now we have that one lantern we saw directly below us. We're going to walk down carefully to this hidden cave and get another piece of candy. This time it's Akko's sugar. Sugar candy made in Senpo Temple, sustaining Akko's blessing. Boost attack power for a time. You become stronger. You deal more vitality damage with Akko sugar. Bite the candy and take the Akko stance to impart its inhuman benediction. The spirits embody excess karma. One must bite down hard on the candy and endure what has been brought to pass. Again, left here, or at least created, by the Senpo monks. See some more areas we'll be exploring here in a moment. And this is our way back, this grapple point. This path is now clear. Now we could go up and above. We could do a stealth kill right from here. Or what I like to do is to drop down to these bushes. We're going to double jump and grab this ledge. Because this is another really satisfying death blow. We already saw this move with the one enemy down below the bridge in Ashina Reservoir. But even, but even better... Careful, I accidentally did a climb. We can now grab this enemy's attention. He has the hat, so he is a little bit more difficult than your standard enemy. Wait for him to come over. And take him out as well. Collect our loot before we even climb up. Now the other enemy has absolutely no idea that we're even there. Let's collect some loot. We've got Fistful of Ash hiding in this one campfire. We have another pellet sent to storage. And if we wanted to, we could do a stealth kill on him, or, since he's all by himself now, we can just get that death blow. Another Ungo Sugar there, in fact, two more. So that takes care of this little zone. In the next area, we have dogs. Now, in From Software games, dogs have always been, well, let's just face it, the bane of our existence. Sekido made them a lot easier to deal with. Once we have a certain set of tools at our disposal, it makes it even easier. But for now, even just armed with Kusabi Maru, we can take them out. So there's one right there. 
plunging attack definitely works. Let's wait for this one to come at me. And you can even get a deflection on the dogs. Or simply take a step back and a single swing will do with them. Dogs are not nearly as difficult as they once were. And we have this tall grass that we could hide in if we wanted to. You even have a grapple point down below. Get another couple of ceramic shards. And here is our next sculptor's idol. I'm going to sit here just to activate. I'm not going to rest. And instead, what I want to do, I'm going to grapple onto the top of this roof. Not going inside just yet. Because I want to deal with this enemy right here. So this giant rooster. I was told that this is a type of spirit. Known as a, and I might be pronouncing this incorrectly, a Busan or a Busan. Don't know much about it, but really cool bit of information that, you know, they are actually trying to use some different mythological creatures. And we have that war banner right there with a general waiting for us. That is going to be our first mini boss here in Sekido. But before we go and take him on, I'm going to grapple to this lower ledge. And remember that Tengu who took Lord Kuro along with Genichiro in that opening fight? I'm not saying this is exactly that Tengu because there are a number of them. But here is another Tengu with a particular item. The Shuriken Wheel. A mechanical device made by the mechanical genius Dogen. It's again mention of Dogen, Emma's master. Not necessarily master, but she apprenticed under Dogen. Can be fit into the Shinobi prosthetic to become a working prosthetic tool. While it is palm-sized, a surprising number of shuriken can fit into the shuriken wheel as the edges were designed for stacking. A fine example of what can be achieved when one matches mechanical finesse with a shinobi's talent. Here it's just telling us that we can go back to the sculptor in order to have that fit in. And once again, before we take out that general, I just want to get a little bit more of the lay of the land. So we've been traveling all around Ashina outskirts, we have this long section right there. Another mini boss awaits us. We have this pellet, or actually three pellets. And really, this is just trying to draw our attention because we can get even more of the battlefield. We can see a number of grapple points, and we have that cave right below us. Once again, the lantern signifying that there's something down there. We'll get that next time after we've cleared out some enemies. In fact, we're not even going to take out this general in this episode. That will wait until next time. But since we did get a new shinobi tool, let's head back to the dilapidated temple and see if we can get it fitted. Here's a good look at the sculptor carving the Buddha, holding it between his legs and again only using his right arm. I found one. A shinobi tool? Yes. I said before that your prosthetic arm was a fang. But by fitting shinobi tools to your arm, you'll be able to change the form of that fang. Thick shields, break them into splinters. Swift foes, bring them down from afar. Fitting more devices means more ways to slay your enemies. If there's someone that needs killing, there's a proper way to kill them. That's all there is to it. Hmm. Seems you know this prosthetic very well. I should calm myself. The more I speak of bloodshed, the more demonic my sculptures will become. Give it here. I'll fit that tool for you. Just got some more information that seems somewhat trivial at this point, but... The sculptor was saying that the more he talks about and thinks about bloodshed, the more demonic his sculptures become. I think at this point it's safe to say he is missing his left arm and the tool that we're wielding, the shinobi prosthetic, once belonged to him. So he's a former shinobi and now he has dedicated his life to carving the Buddha. So we can fit the new prosthetic tool. So the loaded shuriken is what we're going to obtain. Pull a shuriken, load it into the wheel, and launch it at a target in a single flowing motion. The swiftly thrown shuriken damages enemy vitality and posture, particularly against those with a tendency to take to the air. Any enemy that is either flying or jumping at you will take extra damage with the loaded shuriken. If you hit Y or triangle on your controller, you can see exactly how it's used. Right now, we just have the base 
loaded shuriken. So right trigger will throw a shuriken that's been loaded. Let's get that crafted. No matter what I do, any Buddha I carve is an incarnation of wrath. Thus is the fate of those who owe a deep karmic debt. You will understand when you try carving one for yourself one day. So, need something? Yes, right up to... Once again, getting even more information about this sculptor here. His Buddhas tend to take on an incarnation of wrath. He says that one day we'll find out when we carve our own. wonder why he believes that one day we will carve our own. And there we just got a couple of spirit emblems. That is how we use the Shinobi prosthetic tools and a few other skills that we'll collect along the way. We can get these emblems either by purchasing them at a Sculptor's Idol. You can see here right now they only cost 10 sen. That does increase as we defeat certain bosses, so it is an absolute steal right now. We can hold up to 15 for now. There is a way to increase that slightly, and then we can hold them, the rest of them, and then we can hold the rest of them in storage. A drifting white paper doll. Feelings of remorse are not limited to the hearts of men. Such a sentiment may even manifest itself in a fleeting, illusory form. Using certain actions, such as prosthetic tools, will consume spirit emblems. We can also get them pretty easily just by killing enemies. There's even a certain item that we'll get that once we use it, temporarily we'll collect more spirit emblems from every enemy that we kill. But that is going to do it for this episode of Everything Possible in Sekido, Shadows Die Twice. I hope you learned something, and if you did, please leave me a comment below and let me know what you learned. Or if you have something else that you'd like to add or something that I missed, please leave that comment as well so we can all keep learning. But I want to thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you next time.